Uh, and today's program, <laughs> we have Leslie Moody Castro. Um, and uh, Leslie and I are going to talk about sharing um, as it pertains to art today. Um, I'm going to let her introduce herself and then we'll kind of start chit chatting. Uh, feel free to put your questions out anytime. It doesn't have to be at the end. We're going to try to like sprinkle them in as we go through. And uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, I, Leslie, what's up? Hi. <laughs> um, feel free to <laughs> questions in at any point in time. That's what we're here for is to answer all these questions and kind of demystify this jurying experience um, or the experience of applying for a jury project. Uh, so my name is Leslie Moody Castro and I'm an independent curator and writer and I live between both Texas, lots of cities in Texas, mainly Austin, um, but Austin and Mexico City where I'm currently at right now and I've been in lockdown here for about nine weeks, I guess. I have a puppy in my lap, so that's what's happening in here. You can't see her. <laughs> um, but I have juried a number of sort of selection projects or selection-based projects from like, you know, uh, residencies, um, a variety of residencies actually to like actual exhibitions um, or to even space like the Cedars Union, which is such an incredible and important incubator. And I think in a, a really innovative model um, that I hope that I hope I can actually learn from and kind of watch throughout time and continue to be informed of because I think that it's it's such a it's such a great creative space and it really offers a lot in terms of sharing and learning and networking and so it's a really great space and I'm excited to be able to only be on the panel um, to select artists to be part of the Cedars Union but to be okay. Sorry, I'm getting messages. <laughs> I was like, what is that sound? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're cursing and it is leaving you out. <laughs> um, yeah, let me tell them to stop messaging me. So, here we are. <laughs> it's live, folks. <laughs> it is. Okay, go ahead. So we're, yeah, that's You're it. just talking about how awesome the Cedars Union was. Um. <laughs> um, Cedars Union is amazing. Yeah, and I'm really fortunate to have been introduced to it and to have been, to be a part of it and, you know, however that is. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, in terms, I will also... Uh, extrapolate that when a, a lot of the advertising for this program specifically talked about uh, applying to exhibitions, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about today, but um, something else that is going to be addressed is applying to uh, residencies or maybe applying uh, for a show um, like, you know, a solo show or, you know, different types of juried processes. Um, the cool thing about having a jury, and one of the reasons it's really important to us, is it allows for uh, different voices to be heard through the selection. So if we have five jurors for the Cedars Union, and um, they all come from really different backgrounds, and that allows us to ensure that our artists that are selected are going to come from different backgrounds as well, and that's not all going to be the same type of art, uh, which is something we really value. Um, and sometimes there's just one juror yeah. and then sometimes there's like a bunch, right? Yeah. I think that's one of the really interesting thing about jury projects in general is that like the jury can always look differently. You know, it's, it's, it, it can, it, it's a really sort of malleable process. You can have one jury, you can have many jurors, um, all of whom, whom are communicating differently. Um, if they communicate at all, I've definitely been on selection panels or juries before where I, made my selection and then never spoke to anyone again kind of thing um <laughs> in some where you know we have multiple roundtable discussions and we sit in a room and we like discuss applicants and personalities and who we want to talk with um and so there's a really broad range that i think makes jurying something really exciting um and there's also a lot of a lot of time and energy and thoughtfulness that's put into it as well yeah well, to speak to that, um, could you tell everyone a little bit about 
what your sort of preparatory process is when you get assigned to be a juror for something like what kind of research you do uh, to yeah. prepare yourself before you even look at applicants? Yeah, the most important um, step one for me is really getting a sense and getting an understanding of envision values of the space or the program that I'm jurying for and to really sort of get an understanding of who I should be looking for. Like, what are the applications that are going to be the best fit? Um, and then I kind of take it from there. Um, and so like every jury or selection committee is really, really, really different. You know, every nonprofit has um, its own identity and that's really important to keep in mind. And, you know, one artist might be great for one project or for one place, but maybe isn't necessarily the best fit for the other. Um, and so it's really important to keep in mind the identity of, of each of the projects or the selection committees that I'm on. Um, and that really helps to sort of guide me in terms of what I should be reading or looking for or what should really stand out, if that makes any sense. Um, mm -hmm. And always like, it's all, I always have to go through the applications multiple times as well. I have like two or three kind of passes that I have to do every time because inevitably I want yeah. everyone to <laughs> and inevitably I want yeah. everyone to win. Um, <laughs> that's also not the, not to the benefit of everyone. Like I said, you know, every, <laughs> every place has its own identity. And so what might be great for one person is probably not great for the next person. And so I have to keep that in mind as well. Um, yeah. So it's always like really, it's a really time consuming process, but it's one that I really, really enjoy. And that was actually one of my questions. That, um, audience, I do some touring too. And one of the things that I've noticed is that I get this fatigue after a while. Like the first couple that I'll read in that hour, I'm like really in tune to everything that they're, that they're giving me. And then I, after I get like towards the end of the list, I find myself being like, you know, brushing something aside too quickly without really looking at it or, you know, I think, I think video art, it can be really challenging too, because it requires so much patience. It's time-based. You can't just like watch a snip of a video art piece and decide whether it's good or bad. So I also, in particular, save those for like a certain brain space. You know, I do too, actually. I've noticed that video for me is also, I love video, which is really weird, but um, what, like, jurying any kind of um, video submissions is really difficult, because, and I think it's because you've already got your face in a screen for so long. Um, like, I have to make sure that I'm, I become very aware of how long I've been spending, because otherwise I slip into that where I'm, you know, I just am, like, passing over things without really paying attention because I get screen fatigue. Um, and so I found that I can probably read submissions for about two hours with a, like a couple of breaks in between. Otherwise, I don't read anything. Otherwise, it just like all kind of passes a lot and like <laughs> I don't pay attention and it just becomes a little too much. Um, and it especially is like kind of difficult because you have to like the, the, the written part of the submissions, um, like that gets really exhausting to read so many statements. And, and so many, you know, inevitably every application says, ask the question, why do you want to be part of this thing? And so almost every answer is particularly, is, is pretty similar or it's, you know, if it was the case of the Cedars Union, you know, artists would normally answer something like, I want to be part of the Cedars Union for the networking. And so it just becomes really repetitive and I have to be really careful to watch out for that. Yeah. Yes. Um, for the residency, I jury. I've warned people when they're applying to residencies to not say that you want to, you want to be there for time and space because like, no shit, like <laughs> that's what a residency is. And so you're basically wasting time. And I mean, not to say that that's not true and relevant. It's just, you have to know that that is what everybody else is saying. Yeah. Um, so be careful there. Um, I, I could not agree more. I juried for a residency in Tulsa, Tulsa Artist Foundation, and and they provide space, honorarium, time, all of those things. Um, and and ninety percent of this applications that we got or that I read said exactly that. Like I want time, space, money. 
And it was like, well, yeah, you're going to get that, but why else? You know, like, what is it about being in Tulsa that's interesting? And, and the applicants that actually addressed it in that creative way um, really, really stood out to me. And, and those were the ones where I was like, oh, this person's really thinking about why they want to be there. We have a question from Robin Moore. Oh my gosh, I forgot about the questions. <laughs> I was like going to be the question person. All right. Um, is there a standard, is there a standard of qualifications for someone to be called a juror? Oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, I, I think a lot of it's just like, I think a lot of it's sort of like network. Um, like if you, I don't know, like for the Cedars Union, like I said, we try to like, we have some people that are just within our network, for instance, um, Jordan Roth and um, Rachel Rogerson of Row 2 in the Mac because they're our neighbors. They're just down the street from us. So we like to like, you know, keep them um, as jurors. But, um, you know, sometimes it's about getting like different perspectives, like a curator and then like maybe an interior designer because we also work with commercially oriented artists as well. Um, but just someone who's going to be able to like have a critical eye and is is familiar enough with the art world that they're not just like saying I like this and I don't like that and they don't question it. Well, and I think uh, it comes you know. down to the structure of of how the program works. Like the Cedars Union asks for different opinions um, of a group of people that are varied in their in their expertise in their taste and aesthetics um, to kind of come in and also in, their, in terms of networking, to come in and kind of choose who we think is the right fit to be in the space of the Cedars Union to sort of interact with the artists that are there and who also can really benefit from the resources, right? Um, and so it's that kind of group of people that are called the jurors. Um, and in that case, like you said, it's, you know, it's either me like as a curator or my perspective as a curator, or it could be my perspective as a writer. Um, it can be an interior designer, you know, it's a whole kind of breadth of sort of professional expertise that comes together to kind of make decisions on behalf of the Cedars Union so that, you know, it's, it, we're continuing to, to create a very unique space and a unique group of people in one community, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, from different backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've, you know, the, it also depends on the show. Like I've, I've had people ask me to like jury high school art exhibitions. And I'm like, sure. Like, you know, and, and I don't know, sometimes if teachers are great because they like, I feel like as an art teacher, you have to learn how to appreciate even work that you don't like, which mm -hmm. is important. You have to like remove your tastes sometimes um, but that actually, um, and Marianne, I'm going to get to your question in a second, um, but, or we are, but I wanted to ask you, uh, Leslie, in terms of like an artist researching who's the juror or mm. who's on the jury for a show or something, um, should they be catering their work to what it seems like the taste of that juror is? Like, would someone look up, like, if, let's say they're familiar with a show that you've curated um, do you think that that should sway whether they apply or not if they know that their work doesn't really fit like an aesthetic that they perceive to be yours? Yeah, I actually think that that's kind of a two-tier question um, because I think the priority is really about researching um, the space or the project that the jury committee is there for. Um, so like I said, like whenever I'm asked to jury something, I immediately think about the identity or the vision of the space or the project. Um, like what are the, what is the mission of the Cedars Union and who would be a good fit within that? Um, and then from there, I think the second step is yes, to kind of curate your work to something that you think would interest the jurors um, or interest whoever is on that panel to make those decisions. Um, you know, if something is like way out of left field, um, if the body of work isn't cohesive, then I'm going to think that maybe the artist isn't thinking about cohesion and, and their trajectory as an artist. Uh, it's really, I've done a lot of these, and so I, like it's really easy to kind of 
for me to pick to figure out like when someone is submitting all of their projects from their bachelor's degree um and so and like, you can see you can tell that it's like it's like you know you're doing your 2d exploration project or you do you're doing the like um color wheel project you know it's and, or like you're doing a design project and after you kind of go through it enough times you can really start to pick those out and what happens is you begin to see that like, or at least I begin to see that that person is really just submitting what they have rather than thinking about a very cohesive body of work to present. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think that it's a, it's a twofold answer. Like, I think that first you should think about why you think you're a good fit for that submission. And then secondly, look at research who's putting eyes on your work. Um, it's, I think it's really important to do that. And a lot of programs, like if you are applying for a program or something that is more um, uh, involved in giving you resources, then there's usually a statement involved. But uh, frequently, you're just mailing in images, and that's all the context your juror might have, um, whether to accept you or not. Um, you got like, you know, your title, your medium, your dimensions. Um, when it comes to that, Leslie, do you have any, like, I think keeping it cohesive is a really great point um, so that they can get a better idea of, like, who you are as an artist by looking at, like, the three images you are allowed to submit. Um, a lot of places give you the option of paying extra to submit more images. Is that something that you feel like um, does a lot for the artist, or do you think you should just, like, give whatever the standard I, is i don't i mean i think that if you're allowed mo i think the most submissions that i've seen will allow at least five to seven images and i think that's plenty um you have to keep in mind too that this juror has probably looked at a lot of, of submissions applications and read a lot of like bios and cvs and whatnot um and so the more cohesive you can be in general with your application like the more um yeah, the more cohesive and then the more like to the point you can be with all of it, make sure it all kind of works together, I think is really important for a super standout submission. Um, I don't think it's necessary to buy more images because the odds are it's probably not like me as a juror, I don't want to see anything extra. <laughs> like I want to see one. Yeah. See all the requirements really well met. And I want to see those images. To, I want those images to be knockout images. And I always tell artists, this is absolutely where you should invest when it comes to submissions for anything. I have seen so many submissions where the artist has taken a photo of like a painting on the floor or like propped up against a wall. So the, the perspective is skewed or like there, it's not a clean white wall. So I can't really tell like what's happening. You have to keep in mind that, you know, I'm not looking at the real work. I'm looking at an image or a reproduction of the work. And so you want that reproduction of the work to be as high quality as it can possibly be, because it's the only thing that is really giving me the best picture of what you're doing. Um, mm. And quite honestly, when I see that an artist hasn't put a whole lot of time or thought or effort into those images, I don't even look at the rest of the submission. <laughs> and it's yeah. a really, like, that's a really harsh reality, but like I spend a lot of time um, reading submissions and really spending time with them. And if the, and it's really clear to me that if the artist hasn't done the same on their end, then they're just kind of cobbling something together that's not very thoughtful. Um, now that said, I do know that getting images is, is getting high quality images is costly, is expensive, um, but there are ways to go around that, make an exchange happen with a photographer friend. Um, you know, I like the exchange barter system that happens in the art world is really phenomenal to me. And it's something that can be used in, in this case, you know, or do a, do, you know, do a barter system with a photographer friend that can teach you about how to photograph your own work. Um, mm -hmm. Something that can like elevate the quality of the work in a creative way. I think that's really, really important to keep in mind. Yeah, that's, um, you know, one one of the things as soon as we can get our workshops up and running again at the Cedars Union that we're going to focus on is as how to document your work because we have like strobes and photography equipment for artists to use and it makes such a difference. But that said, you can go, you could go pretty far with the iPhone 
yeah, these awesome. days. <laughs> and <laughs> we actually, um, I recently reposted on our Cedars Union account a really excellent um, video tutorial from Kay Cedig, who's uh, a local artist. She was actually a colleague of mine at, um, when I taught at UNT. But um, it's on our, it's on our Instagram. Maybe I'll repost it today just because it's yeah. relevant. But it's just tips on how to use nothing but an iPhone and editing apps since so many artists are like deprived of their regular photography spaces right now. Um, and uh, yeah, just even cropping down. Like if you don't crop down your images, if it's like clearly skewed or like one half of it is really dark. That, so that's the answer for your question, Lisa, is have you noticed what helps a work jump out to you or what is an instant no? An instant no is just like really crappy photography. It really is. Because yeah, also, I mean, it shows me that you don't, like the artist is not respecting their own work either to like give it the best image or the best reproduction that it can possibly have. And that's just a really important part of the process. Um, I go immediately to images before I even look at the bio or CV or the statements. Um, and so if I'm, if I'm turned off immediately by a bad image or bad image quality, then it's gonna make reading the rest of the application really, really difficult. Um, and again, like I, I totally agree with you is that you don't need to have high quality photo equipment and a great, like an iPhone and like great lighting is totally fine. Um, yeah. that's, yeah, it's, it doesn't need to be super fancy, but yeah, get some tips or, you know, think of ways in which you can like be creative about how you f photograph your images before submitting. Um, okay. I'm trying to catch up on some of these questions. Um, do you, is there anything that makes work jump out to you? I mean, good, good work, but you know, is there any tips for, I think it goes back to the images. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see. Uh, there's a question about the statement. Um, how important is the artist's statement to the juror? For me, it is important. And for me, it is important. But in most submissions that I've worked on, you have like 250 to 500 words in the sort of statement section to write. But I will say, um, I was working on a jury process like back in December and I think I had like 250, maybe 300 submissions I had to read. And the one that still to this day stands out to me is that the artist had written a three sentence statement. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was cohesive, it answered the questions, um, it, was, it was concise and it was actually really, really well written. Um, and it, for me, it was just like such a breath of fresh air. Uh, his images were like really, really, really thoughtful, really well photographed, really well put together. It was a very cohesive um, just submission in general. And it was really one of those things where it was like, in the moment even, I was like, I'm going to remember this forever. I've never seen a three sentence statement before. <laughs> and yeah. like, what a relief to get that as a juror when I had already read like 150 submissions, you know? Um, and so I think like putting yourself in, in the other person's shoes, I think everyone, if they ever have a chance to jury anything should always do it. But like putting yourself in the other person's shoes and thinking like, how much are they looking at? How much are they reading? And like really trying to be empathetic to that is really important. Um, but yeah, the, the statement is important to me. I like to make sure that not only is it really like really well written, but it's actually explaining what the artist is trying to do. I get statements all the time that are basically like describing everything in the world. Like those statements like, my work is about lightness, but it's also about darkness. It's like, you, you, you know, like it's, it's, it's one of those that like, it doesn't, it's encompassing everything and that's not possible. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, know? I want yeah. to, you know, like really clear. <laughs> yeah, we've done, we did two different uh, lectures um, or like, tutorials this year on writing an artist statement um, for application. My, the one I gave was like specifically for applications because to me the statement is so important and, and I'm you know the my during experience is for residency and it just shows your it can show your maturity as an artist and if it's too long I, I just won't I can't read it because it's just like <laughs> yeah 
but but you really want to look at like every sentence or every little bit of your writing and, and sort of measure how critical that statement is to understanding your work. It's all, you just want a really robust, no fluff statement that's kind of like, this is my work, this is why I want to be in this space, or this is my work, this is why I want to be in this show. Um, I totally agree. Yeah. And you know, I love beautiful writing. I love like fluff writing. I love it. But when it comes to things like this, like submissions and jurying, I don't want to read it. Like it's, it's, to me, I find it really distracting to the work. I want it just cut and dry. I want to know what you're doing. I want to know what you think you're doing and if that translates to the work. Um, yeah. So I agree. Like editing is so important here. Um, and also to make sure that that statement, like you can have a great statement, but if it looks like it has nothing to do with the work, then it, that's not going to help you either. So make sure you, you pick images to go with your statement instead of just putting like, oh, this is a statement I use for everything. It's really obvious when someone does that. <laughs> yeah, the statement, like the statement should be malleable, just like you're your professional career, you know, ebbs and flows. And so those should change all the time, all the time. Um, and I recommend revisiting all the, all the time as well. Um, yeah, and it should definitely match the work that you're submitting. Uh, so Brantley was asking about the description section of the image submission. I feel like sometimes that it depends on like if it's in tandem with the statement or if it's like, there's no statement, but you get a description option. They're kind of one, they can be one in the same. I, I think that, so in the description, is it just a space where you can kind of, I've, I haven't actually seen too many descriptions. Does it give you like measurements, uh, medium, things like that? I think, I think like for instance, cafe, um, which is a common uh, application tool that artists use and ap applications will use. Um, it will allow you to have like, you know, you put in all your information and it gives you room for a statement or sorry, a description of the work. Um, and I don't know, I think it, it's all the same stuff applies to a statement, like keep it short. Um, but if it's, I don't know, if it's in, if it's in, in addition to a statement, then, um, I think that that's just something that the, the juror might not read. I, I used Cafe for the first time not too long ago, and I actually, I think that the, um, I read some of the descriptions if I did have more questions about the work or if like the images weren't the best quality, but it was almost too much information, honestly. Um, I, I probably wouldn't continue to use it. Um, yeah, because okay. the regular submission kind of has all of that in it already. I want to see the title, I want to see the date, I want to see really good dimensions, I want to see really great photos and a great statement. What about um, detail shots? Do you think that that's something that artists should do if they have the option? Yeah, if there's space for it, I think that I think that it's a really good idea, especially if like work um, has like a three dimensional element or if it's like, if it's a 2D work that like, like has a lot of depth and perspective to it, I think it is a good idea. Um, a lot of times for painting, I really like to see what the brush strokes look like. And so for that, it's, it's really good to have nice details. Um, I think nice details are really great for sculpture. Um, it helps kind of give you like a three-dimensional idea of what that piece can actually be. Um, so you have space for it, then yeah, take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm still like going, I have like all my questions, but I'm so distracted by how great everybody else's is that I'm like- There's so many questions. <laughs> I know, right. Um, Sean asks, how, influ how, how influential is the CV? Um, and is it best to include a bio? you know, with information like where you graduated and stuff like that. I think that fill in as much information as you can. Oftentimes, like what we just said in the description area, a lot of like submission platforms don't have those subscriptions or submission, sorry, description areas. 
Um, so I'm not used to reading them and I don't think that they're totally necessary, but whatever information that the submission process asks you for, fill it out and fill it out thoroughly and um, with cohesion and with make sure it's concise. Um, I, the CV question, that's a really, really good question. I, I tend to look at the CV. I, I, I'm really interested in where people are coming from when they apply to things. Um, and so I look at it, but it's not like a deciding factor for me about whether someone should get in or should not get in. Um, I'm just really interested in like, you know, where people are coming from when they apply. Um, I really like to like kind of know who's self-taught and who's gone to school, but just as a, it's a fascinating sort of piece of information to me. But I am not going to make a decision on someone's quality of work or whether or not they're a good fit by education level or, you know, like opportunities necessarily. Um, for me, it's really about the body of work, the images, and it's really about the statement. Um, and I also just want to make sure that they're a good fit for the place that they're applying to. Um, the bio. Yeah. I usually just say your graduate in there. Um, in the bio section, that's a really good question, actually. Um, this this can, vary a lot. What's that? I said this vary a lot. Like the, I think the approach to a bio is can be so different. I agree. I think this is also a really great place where you can show a little bit of your personality. Um, like at the bottom of my bio, I think it says something like, I believe mariachis make everything better, which is true. Um, <laughs> it's very true and I mean it. Um, but it's also like, it's my attempt to kind of push beyond the, like the rigidity of the art world and like the standardized bio. Um, I like to read bios because I like to see how people have arrived to different places. And so I think it can be another space where you can talk about your sort of trajectory as an artist and how you arrive to a place and a body of work um, and kind of allow the statement to talk about your entire sort of the trajectory of what you're submitting and why you're a good fit for that submission or sorry that that project yeah yeah um if, and if they ask like you know all this it's if if it's not in there like as a little space where you can give it then don't try to fit it in Absolutely. Um, but if it's, it's there, extra. Exactly. I mean, if it's there, <laughs> then why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, Regina, that's a really good question. Sometimes given evaluation rubrics and others helpful to you. Uh, a lot of times like submittable and, oh my God, there's another one. They ask you to rate the submission from between like one and 10. Um, I find that to be really, really, really difficult. And I have to actually have to go back more times to kind of, to kind of really answer that well, not well, but like to, like, like I've, I feel like I've given the submission justice. I have to go back multiple times um, because to me, rating those things and like working with those evaluation rubrics also depends on the entire pot of submissions, you know? So it's like, compared to one submission, maybe that submission is better, a better fit than another one that I thought was a good fit. So I always go back and forth on that. Um, at the end of the day, it comes down to like the, the images and, and the statement for me. Um, but oh. yeah, sometimes there are rubrics, sometimes there are not. Leslie, can you talk about like the scale of some of the things that you've juried, like I know you mentioned, I think it kind of helps people understand the fatigue a juror might go through. You mentioned like 200, 300 applications. Um, what for, I mean, I know it varies a lot, but what would you say is like an average, sh well, there's not, that doesn't really exist. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's a, <laughs> you know, this conversation is always a really interesting one because it's like, they all, it all exists, right? You know, it's like, the, this process can change depending on what the project is for. Um, for the biennial, for example, I, I received 1,217 submissions and I read every single one of them. I read every single one of them beginning to end. Um, usually I'd say like anywhere between, if it's like an exhibition, like an open call exhibition, anywhere between like 300 and 500 is pretty standard. Um, if it's for something like a residency, uh, probably between 
200 to 300 is pretty standard. Um, I, I've definitely gotten used to seeing more than 100, 150. <laughs> Yeah. Given. Well, and like keeping that in mind, uh, something that uh, we talked about the other day, like when I finished grad school, like part of the reason that people apply to these things is the CV, right? There's this understanding that you want to keep your CV active. And the best way to do that is to be getting into shows. Mm -hmm. And so at first I was applying to like, I'm a printmaker. So like anything printmaking related, I was applying to. Um, but, you know, generally you're looking at like 25 to, you know, $35 every time you apply to something. And then if you get in, you got to ship it there and get it framed and you have to really like consider the costs. How do you think an artist can decide or, or do you have any recommendation for artists on knowing like what is a good show for them to apply to or when they should kind of give themselves a break on not applying to everything? I think, I don't think you should ever apply to anything. And I think you should always allow yourself a break whenever you feel you need it. Um, maybe sort of set a budget on like how much money you're going to devote to applications that year. I also don't think artists should apply to anything that is more than $35. Like getting up to the $40, $50 range is really expensive. And I think that's kind of exploitative. Um, 20, 20 to like $30 to $35, I think is okay because it, it, you know, it is, it does require resources to pay jurors to look at all that work. Um, yeah. And the software, uh, yeah. like, you know, I know our slide room account is, is expensive and yeah. it makes it a lot easy for a juror to look at, but you know, it's a cost you have to pay. And it's a cost that a lot of people don't think of. Like there is a back end cost to things that is really real. Um, and so I do, I do think that like paid submissions are fair, but I think that like up to a certain point, um, and I think like really determining whether you should apply or not um, is really about, again, going back to what the goals, what the values are, if you and your work seem like a really good fit, not only for the project or the residency or the Seekers Union, whatever it is, um, but if, you know, when you research the jurors, if you think that your work would be appealing to them as well, um, because otherwise you're, you're, you know, using money on one sort of jury project or one submission when it could go to something else where maybe you're a better fit and have a better, maybe a better um, level of getting in, I guess. That's not really the way to say it. But um, yeah, and so I really think like determining, you know, what, whether you're a good fit for that is a really, really, really important standard to set. Um, and also keep in mind, like, you don't have to submit it immediately. Like there's deadlines. And so if you want to like keep wait on it and wait until the very last day of the submission, that's fine. We're not judging you on what time you turned it in. Um, it's, I think really being considerate about how you apply to things is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and you were also talking about like the importance of doing research on the program before you apply instead of just like giving the same application to everything you send in, yeah. um, I think is also I work on good a advice. Um, in Austin, and when this happens to us a lot, the residency is sort of an experimental space. Um, we do a lot with like sound work, we do a lot of performative work, a lot of like just really ex experimental, like between um, like internet-based work. It's, it's all, it's really across the board, but very rarely do we do just like standard 2D work. And we get a lot of painters that like want to go to Austin and just be in Austin. And so there's a lot of like really like minimal painting that we get. And every time we're just like, well, that, they didn't read the criteria <laughs> or like they weren't paying attention <laughs> to our website and who the artists are that we've brought in the past. And it's, it's really, really obvious. Um, and it doesn't look good, honestly, it really doesn't. It looks like you haven't done your research. Um, let me get to some more of these questions. Earlier you were saying, make sure you have really good dimensions. Michelle was asking what you meant by that. Just make sure they're accurate. Make sure they're really accurate. <laughs> and I would actually put this recommendation in there that's pretty small. Um, if you're applying for something that's in Europe, translate your, uh, your dimensions to centimeters. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great thought, yeah. Because and make sure you can afford to get it there if it gets in, yeah, everybody. Point. Calculate point. that first, because 
if you get a, if you might be so excited that this piece that you love gets into something and then afterward you realize that you didn't really, you, you're going to need to like create a shipping crate for it and then, yeah. you know. Really good point. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, that makes a really small, big, big but small difference. Like it's, um, do the conversion for the dimensions if you can. <laughs> it makes mm -hmm. you care. <laughs> okay. Um, and Marianne was asking about smarter entry. I don't, I've never heard of smarter entry. I actually yeah, haven't that one either. I've never used it. Yeah, but the main ones I've used is like Cafe and I really love Slide Room. It's my favorite. But I like Slide Room, but I think my favorite is Submittable. Um, mm. and it's really, Submittable is really good. Like it's very um, organized for the artist and it's a little bit more complicated for the person reading. Like you can download everything and see it, but then you have to kind of sort it. Um, but I really, really like Submittable. It makes it very easy to use. Um, okay, and then something that Marianne asked earlier that I wanted to talk to you about too is, you know, knowing that like kind of first and foremost, you consider yourself a, a independent curator not every juror is also a curator, but where do you see those kind of thought processes or those practices overlapping in, in the process of juring a show? Um, I think for me, I, I'm, I'm so spatially connected and I'm so process oriented that that's probably why the images are really important to me and probably why like really accurate dimensions are important to me. I want a sense of space and scale um, and so those definitely overlap in my practice and with jurying. Um, I also like to think a lot about how things communicate, um, like how, how things work in space. Um, and so those kind of overlap as well. I think, and then I really also, I just really like um, having a broad sort of network of artists. I, I like um, learning about new artists, learning about their practice, learning about where they are in their place. And doing these sort of jury things is one of the ways to, to be able to do that, to be introduced to an artist's work that I didn't know before. And I actually do take notes. Like I, I will, I have an email, like a blank email open whenever I am like reading submissions and whenever a submission pops up that I think is really interesting, then I add that artist's name to a list in an email and then I go back to it later. Um, and so it's, it's something that like, it's, it's a resource and I consider it a resource for myself as well. And that definitely plays into my practice. Um, and actually this goes into a question that Rebecca asked, if a juror doesn't select your work for one show, is there value in applying for a different show with the same juror? Yes, 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 yes. Um, there's an artist named Catherine Allen in Midland, Texas. She got into the biennial and applied for a, an exhibition I did with ICOSA in Austin. and her work was such a great fit and I knew it, I knew it would be a great fit. And so naturally she just like, as I recognized her work immediately and was like, she's a great fit for this. And so she got in the show as well. It does, it does make a big difference. I, I am very visual. I mean, I think most of us are. Um, and so whenever I see like repeat work or repeat names, it like definitely like sticks into my head. Um, and I remember it, yeah. So it's definitely worth it's definitely worth applying to a project with the same jury, yeah. That's also, it brings me to something else we kind of talked about is um, whether seeing, I mean, you get this kind of unique view of what's going on in art by having to look at like a thousand or 500 applications to something. Um, is there any insight that you've kind of gleaned over the past couple of years or things that you feel like you've learned through juring about practice today? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that's also one of the things I really like about jurying things. Um, you kind of get a really nice breadth of what's happening, like, and what's happening internationally, strangely, um, you know, like painting became super in fashion again, like in the mid 2000s. Um, and lately I've been seeing a lot of like traditional craft, like ceramics or sewing. Um, and, and it's really cool to see that. And it's really cool to see how those trends kind of shift um, and like what causes trends to shift. Um, 
Yeah, I like I like that a lot. And like naturally, since I like to look at the overview of what's been submitted, what end up what ends up happening if it's for like an exhibition, for example, is that the ex the final exhibition will kind of be very illustrative of like what was submitted. So I juried something in Tyler, and there was a lot of like um, sewing and craft that ended up in the show because that was a lot of what we got submitted. It was really cool. Um, yeah, you do. You get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of shows I see that come across, uh, my alerts that are really specific. Do you have any opinion on like people who are organizing a show, um, and, and they know it's going to be an open call. Do you think it, there is any, like what, what is sort of the plus and minus of having a show that are like, we want work about this and then it's an open call. Cause it's kind of like a reverse curatorial process, right? It's like, normally if you want a very specific kind of work, then you pick it and you curate the show, but it sort of leaves a different. Yeah. You know, avenue. I go, I could go both ways on that. Like I, I actually don't have a problem with it. Um, I think it's just, um, you know, if you're looking for something that is about a specific theme or has a specific medium, you know, and then like you put it out there for an open call, I think what it does is it expands your network. Um, and I think that's really cool. Like other people are doing things in a different way that you hadn't seen before. And, and that's one of the, the benefits of doing these open calls. Um, and so I'm not, and I also, I very much believe that the curatorial practice can be open. I'm not one that will argue for agency by any means. Um, and so however that, that practice becomes democratic and becomes much more open, I think is really, really interesting. Um, and so I, I think, I think it's an interesting exercise to see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think it like, it can all exist. Why not? <laughs> um. Uh, Marianne asked uh, if you should say your sh shows are juried, juried or curated. So like in your CV, I'm guessing you mean Marianne. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, it, it, you, if you have to submit to get into the show and if you're sub accepted through a submission process and you should say it's juried. Otherwise, if it's a whole curator choosing your work to be in the show, then that's a cohesive curated exhibition. Um, and, and that curator has chosen every single person in the room. Um, it's, yeah, I can see how it's a fine line. And oftentimes, you know, the, the, there will be multiple jurors involved and that's very different than a curation. Um, and so if you have to submit to it, then, then yes, it's a juried show. Um, yeah, and sometimes it'll, you can say, I've seen in people's C CVs, they'll have like juried shows and then they'll list them or you can like list the show and then say in the next line, juried by. Um, so there's different ways to do that. Um, okay, we got more questions. Um, that is unusual. <laughs> I know. So I waited till close the end. Speaking of presentation, you both look okay. Um, good, I'm right by a window. So lighting's important. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have in my apartment or loft, I actually like live I'm in this like street facing Deep Elm. If, if you frequent Murray Street, I'm their neighbor. Um, and it's not the most comfortable place to sit, but I sit like where a window is right in front of me. Um, uh, Kay Seedig's uh, tips on photographing your work with an iPhone, a lot of it is window placement. So natural light is great. <laughs> I am in my bedroom because, because I get the best lighting um, with a giant window there behind me. That's my bed. <laughs> um, and I'm sitting on the floor. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, there was a New York Times, right when lockdown was beginning, uh, they put out an article that Tom Ford actually, uh, he gave like wrote tips for setting up best lighting in your house. So. <laughs> Google, Google that, Susan. Um, piece by Libertad that I love to show off, and so it's just a really nice place to sit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Uh, oh no, I mean for TV AA. I don't. I'm. I'm not sure. TV again. 
I don't know what TVAA is. I'm sorry, Marianne. I'm going to Google it. You can, can you post a link in the chat? I know you can't talk back, which is awkward. Um, <laughs> we're going to move on to the next one. Um, Kelly Madden, uh, will a transcript be available for this event? Oh, uh, uh, no, no. A transcript won't be available. However, the recording will be. So if this was uh, information that you would like to come back to, you're going to receive a, uh, a link. Um, from me via email tomorrow that you can go back in and look at the watch the whole thing or fast forward to a part that you liked but anyone who registered for this can get it and, and you can re register in retrospect so like if you go home and tell your friend like hey I, I listened to this great thing they can watch it too they just have to register uh, we are working now that we have more of these coming up we are working on some kind of way of like having a catalog of um, our virtual programming on our website, but it is not yet in the works. Um, but good question. No transcript, but a recording for sure. Oh, Texas Visual Arts Association. I don't know much about how the TVAA process works, but I think it's a jury. Is it a jury? I, I don't know. Um, they, should, they should publish it. If not, sometimes it's juried in house if they don't mention it, <laughs> um, and they're they're just not like you know, it's not important for them to be forward about their jury. Our jury is always listed in the about section of our um, of our website, and we uh, Leslie was new this year, but we probably will change over. We're a little different because we don't do them. We only have a our our call for artists in our space happens every 18 months so it's not that frequent um, because the incubator is an 18 month program um, and it's going to be really different this time because we actually paused the whole we, we were starting a brand new incubator session right when at lockdown happened um, so they were supposed to be moving out in like october 2021 and now it's Diff the date's just kind of a moving target at the moment. Um, I looked it up, um, Marianne. Yes, that it, TVAA is is more like a jury process um, where there there's multiple voices looking at work, and so yeah, I would call that a jury. I hope that I hope that answers that better. Um, are you given parameters regarding the number of total entries to accept into a show, or do you have flexibility? That's a great question. That is a great question. Um, oftentimes I'm not giving parameters or given parameters. I'm given um, suggestions um, like that, you know, whoever people know their space better than me oftentimes. And so like for Tyler, I, I asked, you know, the dimensions of the space and how many works can fit comfortably. And they, they told me like a range of like seven to 12. Um, can fit comfortably depending on dimensions. And so I kind of worked within that range. Um, I tend to work with the floor plan a lot. Like I tend to get a, a sense of like what the floor plan is like and to kind of work down from that to make sure that there isn't too much overcrowding in the space. Okay. So yeah, you, and if, if there's a really big piece, I mean, you, do you ever have trouble with like, here's a piece you really like, but it just can't fit? Right, exactly. And that happens. <laughs> it totally happens. And yeah, so I'm not given parameters per se, but definitely given suggestions, which are really, really helpful. Okay, Marianne, now I get what you're saying. Sorry that that was like, you had to ask so many questions to get to the point. Um, Yes, it sounds like if you have people, like, so not, the difference is when, when I asked her question, I should have been more clear. What do you think the difference is between a curator or a juror, Leslie? Is there one time you would definitely say curator versus juror? I always, I always say curator. I'm always a curator no matter what. But, I'm, but like when I'm asked to jury something, I'm part of the jury committee. Um, whether I'm one juror or part of multiple people on the jury committee. 
Um, and so we all come to it from our different backgrounds. Like there can be a filmmaker that is a filmmaker, but is also a juror in that moment. So it's kind of like a temporary job description, if that makes sense. Um, I'm always a curator, but I'm not necessarily curating my own exhibition. Um, I'm part of a team or part of, or a voice curating a group of people and their work or sorry, jurying a group of people in their work. And so I think that both hats always fit, if that makes any sense. Um, okay. No, 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 it's very important. Sorry, are the only one, what if you were? Um, if I'm the only one deciding, then usually what we'll say is curated and juried by. Um, or juried by curator Leslie Moody Castro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, does that, Marianne, does that help you? I'm sorry for, again, I'm like t looking at the screen somewhere as if I'm trying to address you. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> it, it, yeah, okay, good, thank you, thank you. Uh, you, also, Marianne, one tip I would say uh, that we've we've made a mistake about that, like, still kind of haunts me with our last uh, Cedars Union call is um, our uh, limit. We were really careful to put a limit on statements because I've had disastrous situations where there's not, um, and we thought we were doing uh, words and it was characters, um, so we ended up with all these sh very short statements and then we were like why is everyone only writing like two sentences and they weren't necessarily like not everyone can give that perfect three sentence statement yeah. that you referred to um but once you but once you've made that mistake and people have started applying you can't you want to make it for, fair for everybody so just like be really intentional about what you set as your questions and the way you word your questions and like you know, do you need a bio and a CV and a website or, you know, all those things. Um, things that you start to realize only after you're going through like 500 applicants. Are there any other questions? I'm trying to make sure I got to all of these. Great question. Um, like, yeah. The discussion we've had. Oh, it's great, thank you. Yeah, this was this was good. And and I want to say everybody who is listening or anyone who listens retroactively later on, um, if you have a suggestion for a topic that you would like to to learn more about from the Cedars Union, um, here, I'm going to put my email on the chat. Please let me know. Um, you're probably not the only one if that's the case. Um, here we go. It's easy. It's Adrian at Cedars Union. Um, yeah, so just reach out and we can consider it, uh, especially these days. Our, our programming oh, hi, uh, isn't, <laughs> isn't very far planned out at the moment because everything keeps changing. Um, so hit us up. And uh, yeah, let's see. I think that we sort of went over everything organically that I had written down to ask you, which is pretty cool. Um, and if any other- Most questions, common mistakes. If any yeah, other- Anything else? If anyone ever wants to ask me, by all means, feel free to connect us. I'm always available. That's very generous of you. Um, okay, cool. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Our next program is um, a conversation with uh, Sachi Art. It's sort of like a mammoth um, online art sale um, platform, um, and we're talking with one of their assistant curators, and we're going to talk about, like, really online art sales, trends they see, um, you know, the kind of like that business end of, of putting your art on one of those websites. Um, so that should be interesting too. So check that out. That's going to be another Q and A. Um, and then we haven't posted this yet, but in July, we're actually going to do a webinar on um, building a website, which is important because sometimes if you're really torn about an artist, you might visit their website. And if it's terrible, you might say, well, actually, never mind. <laughs> Um, maybe not you. That sometimes happens for me. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. And um, yeah, have a great. How do we get in touch for you guys to jury a show for TVAA? Marianne, I have your email and I will email you. Great. And we'll and copy Leslie. Perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.